close-up view of destruction and heartache. President Joe Biden traveled to Southwest Florida today to survey the damage from Hurricane Ian firsthand, meeting with first responders who are still working around the clock and the victims who lost it all. President Biden stood with his harshest Republican critic, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, as search and rescue teams go door to door in a desperate attempt to track down the missing. The long road ahead to recovery as thousands pack into shelters and wait on long lines for food and water. It's going to take a lot, a lot of time, not weeks or months. It's going to take years for everything to get squared away. And we're not leaving. We're not leaving until this gets done. A major decision from a group of some of the world's most powerful oil producers, the biggest cut in oil production since the start of the pandemic, what this means for gas prices and your wallet. A chilling new glimpse into the kidnapping of four family members, including an eight-month-old baby girl. The surveillance video that shows a suspect take them away. Tonight, the person of interest in custody and the plea from the rest of the victim's family for their return. It's something that nobody is prepared for dealing with, right? So it's, we are just hoping and praying every moment. Nearly a year after her death, the family of a cinematographer shot and killed on a movie set has reached a settlement with actor Alec Baldwin and the producers of the film Rust. New details about the production resuming. The economy and primary election. How the country's finances are playing a role in voters' decision making in one of the most important battleground states. From an idea posted in a TikTok to a published best selling author, I talk with Alex Astor about creating a space for Hispanic women in the world of fantasy. So many no's. I had so many people tell me that my work wasn't good enough, that I would never be published. And I just, I'm glad that I kept going. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Perhaps it took something of this magnitude, a Category 4 deadly hurricane, to get President Biden and Governor DeSantis to stand side by side, working together with one common goal. One week after Ian made landfall in Florida, bringing death and devastation to the Sunshine State, today the president made his first visit to survey the damage in person. Florida's Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, a frequent critic and a potential rival in 2024, offered praise for his response to Ian. Governor DeSantis called it a team effort, while President Biden said they're working completely in lockstep. The search and rescue efforts are still underway in the hardest hit areas. Today, the president acknowledged there's a long way to go with a recovery effort that will take years. But there was one image of progress today, a temporary crossing reopened to reconnect residents of Pine Island to the mainland after the bridge to the island was partially destroyed by Hurricane Ian. ABC's senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce is traveling with the president and starts a off from Florida. President Biden today traveling to Florida to see for himself the devastation of Hurricane Ian, putting politics aside, meeting with one of his harshest Republican critics, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, a man many believe hopes to be the next president. Today we have one job and only one job, and that's to make sure the people of Florida get everything that they need to fully, thoroughly recover. In a rare moment of bipartisanship, DeSantis praising their cooperation. We are cutting through the red tape, uh, and that's from local government, state government, all the way up uh, to the president. So we appreciate uh, the, the team effort. Biden describing what DeSantis has done as pretty remarkable. We have a very different political there's a long way to go here. The National Guard delivering water and aid from Fort Myers to Pine Island, where search and rescue is still underway. The island had been completely cut off. Bernard Tomsey telling me his neighbors were stranded. We're just working people and they can't get off the island, they have no water, they have nothing. But just a few hours later, a temporary crossing opening up. Slowly, the long process to rebuild now beginning. ABC's Victor Okendo out with Team Rubicon, a volunteer group of highly skilled military veterans. We're in Port Charlotte, north of Fort Myers, where residents have been waiting for help for days. Ian brought this massive tree down, blocking this house. The good news, that help has arrived. They're shoring up homes and clearing out debris. Local officials grateful for the help. Cameras capturing the president joking with the mayor of Fort Myers Beach in an unguarded moment.
Yeah, goddamn right. <laughs> Biden says the federal government will be here in Florida for as long as it takes. Nice to see a smile on both of their faces. We got a chance to speak to the mayor of Fort Myers Beach yesterday. Mary Bruce joins us now from Fort Myers. Mary, not quite clear just what the president was joking about there in that unguarded moment, but so many eyes were on the scene of the president and Governor Santos today. I assume it's fair to say both wanted to make it clear that today wasn't about politics. Exactly. And it was a pretty remarkable moment to see the president and one of his biggest Republican rivals very publicly putting their differences on hold. Now agreeing on one thing, that for the sake of the people here in Florida, they have to work together on this. But, Lindsay, with the midterm elections now just 34 days away, it's unclear tonight how long their political ceasefire will last. Lindsay. You're right about that. Mary Bruce from Fort Myers for us. Thanks so much, Mary. And we wanted to check in with someone who knows firsthand the sometimes tricky politics of hurricane response. We're joined now by ABC News contributor and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who's on the road tonight calling in to us. Uh, Governor Christie, thanks so much for uh, giving us the time. Uh, you famously welcomed former President Obama as he visited New Jersey in the wake of Superstorm Sandy just weeks before the 2012 election. As you've watched how President Biden and Florida Governor DeSantis have navigated the past week in their interactions, what stands out to you? Look, I think that both of them had fundamental decisions to make, which is, um, are you going to play politics or are you going to do your job? And, and I think as this continues down the road, that's a regular decision that each of them have to make. Uh, for me, it was, it was easy. You know, we had sustained the second worst natural disaster in American history, and 365,000 homes were destroyed in New Jersey in a 24-hour period. This is not something that you can do anything but do your job and not think about anything else, not consider anything else except the livelihood and the safety and the future of the people who elected you. And President Biden praised the governor and local officials for their response during his visit today, while DeSantis also praised the team effort. Of course, DeSantis is someone who's likely a presidential candidate in 2024 who hasn't been shy about criticizing the president. In a moment like this, I'm assuming that you'll agree that, that politics just gets put aside? It has to be, Lindsay. I mean, if you don't put it aside, you're not doing your job. I'd argue that you're violating your oath if you don't do it. Um, this is a horrible, horrible disaster for the people of the Gulf Coast of Florida. And what they count on Governor DeSantis to do is not to worry about what office he's going to run for next, um, but to worry about how to restore some normalcy for their lives. And so what you need to do, and the same applies, by the way, to President Biden. You know, both of them have to put the people first. And if you do that, then you're doing the right thing, and people will reward you for it. And if you don't do it, they'll punish you for it. Any political liability at all for either of them from the way you see it? Uh, you, of course, got real blowback after Sandy for welcoming President Obama ahead of that election and uh, a hug that people then s described as a bromance. Yeah, well, look, um, we don't have to revisit 10 year ago history except for this. You know, um, you can't worry about those kind of things. Um, I wouldn't have done anything differently if I had to do it all over again. You know, the only way I think there's any long-term political risk is if you don't do your job. And that is something that people will punish you for and rightfully so. And you talk about how this was a different time. I want to go back to 2013. As you likely remember, Ron DeSantis was a new member of Congress at that time, right after Superstorm Sandy. And one of his first votes was against a $9.7 million federal relief package for the Northeast, saying that it contained wasteful spending. And yet now he's openly pushing for federal help for his state. Do you think that there's a little hypocrisy there and that he might be able to face some criticism for that? Well, he's not the only one. I mean, there was a large part of the Colorado delegation who voted against that bill um, and then had river flooding later that time in 2013. You know, this is not an unusual thing. Unfortunately, there are sometimes when members of Congress feel like they get an opportunity to make a symbolic vote. Um, and uh, they don't care about what the downstream effect is. Uh, in this instance, the governor DeSantis, the governor knows, there's no way that the Gulf Coast of Florida recovers without significant financial assistance from the federal government. And so I'm sure his focus will be 
off of symbolic votes and on to uh, you know, votes that are going to help the people of Florida. Chris Christie on the phone with us tonight. Thanks so much for coming on, Governor. Thank you, Lindsay. Now to chilling new surveillance video of the family captain ca kidnapped in California. Police have made an arrest, but the eight-month-old baby girl, her parents and uncle are still missing. ABC's Mola Lange has the details. Tonight, the emotional pleas for the safe return of an eight-month-old and her family in California. Please help us out, come forward, so my family come home safe. Baby Aruhi Derry, her 27-year-old mother, Jasleen Kaur, her 36-year-old father, Jasdeep Singh, and 39-year-old uncle, Amandeep Singh, were allegedly kidnapped Monday. Overnight, authorities arresting 48-year-old Jesus Manuel Salgado. Time is of the essence. That person right now is our, our sole lead. Authorities releasing surveillance video they say shows the kidnapping outside the family's trucking business in Merced. The suspect meeting Jasdeep outside, carrying a trash bag. He then puts down the bag, appears to show a gun before entering the building where police say there are no cameras. Minutes later, they emerge. It also appears that Jasdeep and Amandeep are zip tied behind their backs. Jasdeep and Amandeep are then put in the back of a black pickup truck and driven off. The suspect later returns, retrieving Jasleen and baby Aruhi unrestrained before driving away. Authorities say it's the last time the family is seen on camera. Hours later, the pickup truck found on fire. A vehicle fire in an orchard. There are no signs of the family. Then, early Tuesday morning, investigators say the suspect allegedly uses a victim's ATM card. Authorities identifying Salgado as a person of interest. The sheriff telling ABC News that his family turned him in. The suspect said he had done something wrong and it had something to do with the missing people. Authorities say Salgado attempting suicide, taken into custody in critical condition. He's receiving treatment. Tonight, authorities are holding out hope that he will cooperate and that the family will be found. We're not leaving any, any stone unturned, any blade of grass. Everything we have is out there. Mola Lange joins us now from California. Uh, Mola, do we know anything else about the investigation and also the suspect? Well, Lindsay, police say that it is possible Salgado did not act alone. Of course, they are hoping that they can speak to him. Now, he does have a criminal record, a prior conviction back in 2005 for armed robbery and false imprisonment. Lindsay, he was paroled back in 2015. All right, Mola Lange, thanks so much. Some disturbing developments tonight in the war in Ukraine as Ukrainian forces advance and Russian forces abandon more cities and towns. We're starting to see evidence of torture and abuse by Russian troops. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel reports on what he's seen firsthand. Tonight, Ukrainian forces trying to build on their stunning advances on the battlefield, now pressuring Russian troops in the east and south of the country. Despite his losses, Vladimir Putin signing into law the illegal annexation of the very territory where Ukraine's now advancing. Also tonight, the New York Times is reporting American officials believe Ukraine was behind the car bombing that killed the daughter of prominent Russian nationalist Alexander Dugin in August. The Times report says U.S. officials say they weren't aware of the operation beforehand, provided no intelligence or other assistance in the car bombing, and would have opposed the killing had they been consulted. As Russian troops retreat, a dark picture of torture and abuse is now emerging. We've come deep underground below a police station in the city of Izium that was occupied by the Russians for months. And like so many areas, when the Russians were driven out, the horror stories started to emerge of detention, of abuse and of torture. It's dark down here, it's damp, and you can almost smell the fear of the people who were held here. Mikhailo says he was taken by Russian soldiers, tortured for 13 days and left for dead. The 67-year-old accused of passing information to the Ukrainians. He says he was electrocuted, had metal spikes pushed into his shoulders and his arm was broken with a hammer, all by Russian interrogators. Can you ever forgive? Can you ever forget what happened? His answer needs no translation. And according to the UN... There are now hundreds of Ukrainians with stories just like this. Just heartbreaking. Our thanks to Ian Panel. 
OPEC Plus, the organization of petroleum exporting countries, which includes Russia, has announced that it will cut back production by 2 million barrels a day, a decision that could be devastating for gas prices here at home. Joining us now for more context and analysis is business reporter Alexis Christophorus. Alexis, uh, thank you, as always, for, for joining My us pleasure. to help explain this. So let's just start off with the basics here. Um, why post-COVID, when you have all of the, the turmoil that's happening overseas, why would they do this now? It's a great question, and OPEC's job, in short, is to stabilize oil prices on the global market. For a few years now, because of the pandemic, these 33 countries that make up OPEC Plus have been enduring relatively low oil prices. So what they're trying to do with this production cut is lift the price of oil on the world market. They, they say their sweet spot is at around $90 a barrel for crude oil. They say that will help to stabilize world economies, and they think it will also incentivize investment in the industry. But what it's going to probably wind up doing is sending and gas prices higher around the world. And so what about here at home in particular? Well, you know, a lot of that depends on regional factors. I don't think we're going to go back to that $5 a gallon nationwide average we saw in June. But in California, for instance, we've got folks paying in some places as much as $8 a gallon. Those prices prices should start to come down over the next few weeks because of refinery issues being taken care of there. But overall, you're probably looking at 15 to 30 cents more a gallon in most parts of the country in the coming weeks. Is there anything that the Biden administration can do about this to make sure, again, as you said, we don't get back to those $5 right. on average across the country? There's very little the Biden administration can do. And, and they've said as much. The, the Biden administration has tapped that strategic petroleum reserve. They're probably going to do it again. But those reserves are already at their lowest level since 1984. You can only go back to the well literally so many times before that becomes an issue. You're only supposed to tap that in an emergency situation, not to manipulate prices. The Biden administration could also put a, uh, a limit on how much we export to other countries. But again, that could backfire on this country because it means it's putting less oil on the market, which will just add to the energy crunch, which will make prices go up even higher. And I started off by talking about the war in Ukraine. How much of a factor is that, along with the relationship between Russia and, and Saudi Arabia? How does that play a role here? This gets complicated, and there are so many tentacles. Just three months ago, President Biden met with the Saudi prince, Mohammed al Salman to try and see if he could turn on the spigot and put more oil on the market to uh, give us some relief at the gas pump. He walked away basically empty-handed. Uh, the prince, has, for a long time, has said he admires Vladimir Putin. The two men have had a much deeper relationship recently. So really, this, this alliance between these two countries and also the OPEC decision is really seen as a slap of the face to the Biden administration right now. And how do you think that this OPEC decision might play out in, in the midterm elections? Oh, boy. Well, you know, President Biden has been talking for months now about what he and his administration are doing to help get prices down at the pump. This comes at a critical time for uh, the president. This is really political jeopardy for him as we move closer to the midterms. And in some very pivotal states, where there are some key hotly contested races in the balance, gas prices are the highest there right now. And is this effective immediately? When are they going to actually start the reduction? And when might we see these increases at the pump? Great question. They're going to start it in November. We could start to see price increases at the pump as early as the next couple of weeks because the oil market is anticipatory. So those price rises are already going to start to happen. And by the way, this OPEC production cut is going to be in place through 2023 oh, wow. unless world conditions change. And so this is going to start right around the holiday time. Not exactly. such a great time. Okay. That's, that's a good point, yes. Uh, Alexis Christophorus, our thanks to you as always. You bet. When we come back, the bizarre attack that has investigators perplexed. Why were the suspects wearing body suits? She got a book deal with a TikTok video and then sold the movie rights before the book was even released. Alex Astor tells us the amazing story behind her successful fantasy book. But up next, the controversial school policy in Minneapolis. Union leaders say it's meant to protect certain teachers, but others call it discrimination. We'll take you to the fight to prioritize educators from underrepresented groups. And some are asking if this is the best way to help address historical wrongs. This is ABC News Live.
is the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Investigators in New York City are trying to solve this bizarre attack on a subway train. The problem, you can see it there, all of the suspects wore neon green bodysuits. Two female victims told police it started with an argument and resulted in the suspects pushing and punching them. The attackers also stole the woman's phones and credit cards before taking off at the next stop. Next to our deep dive, looking into the controversy brewing in Minneapolis with the school year now in full swing, it's over a new controversial school district policy. The teachers union voted to prioritize educators from underrepresented groups to help address historical wrongs, but not everyone is pleased with the idea. Our Ike Ajachi has the story. The Tennessee School Board under fire for removing a Holocaust novel from its curriculum. A North Carolina school district is beefing up security. Teachers in Seattle with an important decision to make, return to the classroom or head to the picket lines. Coast to coast, teachers are facing unprecedented challenges. From debates about critical race theory and banned books, to budget cuts and increased worries about school safety. All of the drama that has been surrounding education lately may a lot of teachers feel like they're walking on eggshells. Here in Minneapolis, teacher Tiffany Dowdy is also feeling the stress. One thing that's changed my school is that they cut math. So I am now the only full-time eighth grade math teacher. But there's also an added layer of scrutiny for the school district where Tiffany works, a new policy that's drawn the ire of conservative camps and media outlets, putting her and her fellow Minneapolis educators at the center of a political battle. In the event of layoffs, white teachers have to be fired first, regardless of seniority or performance. It's kind of like racism, right? The union movement and too much of the left that used to, in my view, support laws that prohibited racial discrimination 
are now embracing the exact opposite. As part of a new contract, the Minneapolis Public School District, or MPS, plans to prioritize educators from underrepresented groups in an attempt to remedy the continuing effects of past discrimination. If you go back to Brown versus Board, who were the first teachers to be let go when we, you know, integrated schools? Black teachers. And so, you know, this is like a long history that goes way beyond just our district. Tiffany, or Miss Dowdy as her students call her, fought for that new policy. She's invested more than 10 years of her career teaching for Minneapolis public schools, of which she's a graduate. I told my students a few years ago, being a teacher in Minneapolis is living my dream. She gets to live her dream right here at Ann Watton Middle School. What do you love most about being an educator? Kids, kids. That moment when you know that you've reached them, especially in math. Tiffany has made her mark at her school, but is still considered a rarity. Why do you call yourself a unicorn? Because I'm a woman, I'm black, I speak Spanish, and I teach math. So I think I'm pretty unique. Tiffany has a diverse background, just like the student body at MPS, where roughly two-thirds of the students are children of color. But the majority of teachers in the district are white, similar to the population of Minneapolis. I believe I'm the only black person or person of color on our team. What are some other unique challenges that you face as being one of the only black teachers in your school? I end up representing mm. everyone. Sometimes you feel like people are leaning on you as the resource for students of color. The strain of the pandemic led MPS teachers to stage a strike earlier this year. For three weeks in March, the teachers union fought for a number of reforms. Greta Callahan, a former kindergarten teacher, is the president of the union that represents MPS teachers. She says retaining educators of color was just one item on a laundry list of demands. We don't have full-time nurses in all of our buildings. We don't have uh, the social workers and counselors that our students deserve. We have way too many kids in our classrooms. And the turnover of staff is so high. To end the strike, the school district and the teachers union agreed to a new contract that addressed several needs, such as a living wage for educational support professionals, a cap on class sizes for each grade, and more mental health support for students. The contract also granted staff a one-time $4,000 bonus. Most notably, the district agreed to boost efforts to retain and recruit minority teachers. In the last two years, we've had a couple hundred teachers of color leave our district by choice. One of the aspects of that contract that's getting a lot of attention right now are the layoffs. Can you describe that policy? If there are layoffs, uh, the least senior person, if that person is from an underrepresented group, that person would maintain their position and we would essentially go to like the next person in that seniority list to lay off. Underrepresented. That is a particularly broad term. Can you give us some examples of individuals who would be considered in that category? Yes. It could be someone who is uh, on the autism spectrum and teaches uh, autistic students. Uh, someone from the LGBTQIA plus community. So the term underrepresented can also be applied to white people based on the categorizations that you just laid out, correct? Technically, yes. A majority of teachers and staff who are mostly white approve the policy, which is notable because historically, predominantly white unions have often resisted attempts to correcting racial imbalance. Already, the policy is being challenged in court by a conservative-leaning government watchdog group. It was an in-your-face attack on the rule of law here, especially in the area of racial discrimination. Judicial Watch filed a lawsuit on behalf of a Minnesota taxpayer claiming the contract requires administrators to make hiring and firing decisions based on race. When it comes to layoffs or potential layoffs in this teacher's union contract, if you're black, your name is skipped and the next non-minority gets laid off. And while on the back end, if you get rehired and you're a non-minority, your name is skipped and the next black senior person gets uh, hired. I, I don't understand why this is even a debate. One of the key words used in the contract is the word underrepresented. The union president did say, though, that white 
educators could fall under this category under certain circumstances. Does that make a difference? This section of the contract references teachers of color. Uh, so if they want to litigate what they mean by that, uh, you know, that's what the courts are for. While the policy does not specifically mention the words race or ethnicity, Fitton argues the title of the heading, Protections for Educators of Color, makes it plain. Now, I want you to do the mirror image of that. The contract says protecting white teachers, and then they have language that is seemingly neutral in how they're going to affect that. Do you think a court's going to say that's not race discrimination? I don't buy it. I think it is very likely that a court will look both at the heading that specifically references teachers of color and the body of the document, which references members of underrepresented groups. They'll often look to kind of public comments made in the course of considering or adopting a policy. It's quite routine for courts to cast a pretty wide net in trying to get their arms around what a policy really means and how it is intended to operate. This lawsuit has no teeth. Hundreds of teachers are leaving this profession and we can't fill the positions we have. That's the real fight. I think that the policy is clearly drafted to respond to one of the exceptions that the case law identifies, which is where a policy is race conscious, but is race conscious because of a history of discrimination perpetuated by the very institution creating the policy in question. Arguably, the most important stakeholders in the conversation, though, are the students. Many of them are very aware of the challenges their teachers face and the impact it has on their education. In fact, some were so passionate, they joined the march with their teachers. Teachers are fed up at this point. They're like really getting strict and harsh, but a lot of them are just, you know, tired. These are Tiffany's former middle school students, now high school seniors. They stayed close with Tiffany long after leaving her classroom because of the impact they say she had on them. She gave me like a good real world perspective. Her being like a black teacher, it's, it's nice being able to relate to her like as a minority. Research suggests that having diverse educators in schools is beneficial for all students. The Center for Education Data and Research found that having a teacher of the same race or ethnicity may increase test scores and reduce the likelihood of disciplinary issues. I think like teachers like Ms. Doherty are like, they're that much more important because if you have a teacher who like makes it a place you want to be, I think that helps a lot. I was automatically excited to have her because she's just, she was a black teacher, you know, I can relate to her. Other teachers, it's more of they go home, you know, and we never speak again after that year. But with Miss Doherty, it's longer than a, just a school year. It's forever with her. So about those students, what is it about them that inspires you to stick with this profession? I look out at them and I literally see the future. I feel the weight of the responsibility of my job. Hi, guys. Okay. I know that if I don't do my very best, then I'm failing all of us. Oh, hi, my baby. Oh, oh, oh. Nice to see that lasting impact. Our thanks to Ike Ajachi for bringing us that. Still ahead here, a college student murdered inside his dorm room who police say committed the crime. With the midterms less than five weeks away, the focus for many is on the economy. We travel to Michigan to hear from voters about what will help them decide. Imagine if you won the lottery and then found out more than 400 other people also hit the jackpot. We look into a prize-winning mystery by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from our friends at Abbott Elementary, who flagged us that this is World Teachers' Day. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. 
She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis. The powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring your friends. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Ready for election night. I'm ready for debate night. I'm ready for it all. This midterms is really important. Hi, everyone. We're going to run you ragged. What would George do? We're working on it, George. We're going to make you proud. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. A lottery jackpot last weekend with hundreds of winners is now raising some eyebrows and an investigation is underway. Let's take a look by the numbers. This past Saturday's Grand Lotto drawing in the Philippines had a whopping 433 winners who all selected the correct six number combination, picking numbers between one to 55. Those winners all split the jackpot of 236 million pesos from the Philippine Charity Sweepstakes Office, or about $4 million in U.S. currency. The a large number of winners has prompted an investigation, but there might actually be a rather innocent explanation. That's because the winning numbers were all multiples of nine. The lotto prize went to those who selected the numbers 9, 18, 27, 36, 45, and 54. Lottery officials said it's normal for ticket buyers to choose numbers based on patterns or favorite number sequences, with the lotto general manager saying at a news conference, quote, it's not only good to be loyal to your wives and husbands, it's also good to be loyal to your numbers. But with so many winners, each ticket holder walked away with only about 9,000 U.S. dollars each. Not too shabby, but certainly not the $4 million jackpot that many were likely dreaming of taking home. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. New abuse allegations from Angelina Jolie, what she says Brad Pitt did to her and also their children. Plus, a love connection for a Scooby-Doo character, why Velma's crush is going viral. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. 
unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. One week after Hurricane Ian ripped through southwest Florida, President Biden touring the devastation. It's going to take a lot, a lot of time, not weeks or months. It's going to take years for everything to get squared away. And we're not leaving. We're not leaving until this gets done. The president announcing the federal government will now cover emergency response costs for two months instead of 30 days as originally planned. Governor Ron DeSantis briefing the president on recovery efforts and what's needed the most. A suspect is under arrest in the murder of a Purdue University student. Authorities say 20-year-old Varun Manish Chetta, a senior, was found with stab wounds in his dorm room early Wednesday morning. One roommate has attacked another with a knife, still trying to attain room number. According to authorities, Chetta's roommate, 22-year-old Ji Min Shah, placing a call to police reporting the incident. The junior and international student from South Korea then arrested on a preliminary murder charge. Neither, neither one of them were asleep and... I believe this was unprovoked and senseless. Purdue University assuring students the campus is safe, releasing a statement saying that an investigation is underway. Hollywood producer Eric Weinberg has been charged with 18 counts of sexual assault. Weinberg served as co-executive producer for the hit TV show Scrubs. We're hoping that there are other victims out there that will come forward. We know that there are many more. According to the LAPD, the charges stem from a series of rapes police say happened within seven years involving women in their 20s and 30s, supposedly lured to his home over the premise of a photo shoot. Weinberg has been released on $5 million bail. His lawyer has called the allegations part of a blatant smear campaign. Weinberg was able to commit his crimes using his power and wealth and privilege. And he has now been able to leave custody using his wealth. I believe that we all collectively should be angry. A NASA and SpaceX crew of five astronauts are on the way to the International Space Station after blasting off from Kennedy Space Center in Florida on Wednesday. The group lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center and includes two Americans, an astronaut from Japan's space agency, and a Russian. This despite the current relations between the U.S. and Russia. It was a historic flight. NASA's Nicole Mann became the first Native American woman to go to space and the first woman to serve as commander of a SpaceX flight. The group due at the space station tomorrow night and then and will return in March. We are learning new details about abuse allegations made by Angelina Jolie against her ex-husband, Brad Pitt. They are made in a countersuit that was filed by Jolie, part of the former couple's years-long divorce battle. Jolie claims Pitt physically abused her and at least two of their children during a private plane flight six years ago. Jolie also accuses Pitt of pouring beer and wine on her and their children. Pitt's attorney says Pitt will not accept responsibility for something he did not do. What's got Velma's glasses all fogged up? Why, her new crush, Coco Diablo, of course. Fans of the latest Scooby-Doo film are cheering for the Mystery Inc. gang member's plotline, confirming in the digitally released film Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo what fans have long suspected was Velma's romantic preference. Okay, who am I kidding? I'm crushing big time Daphne. What do I do? James Gunn, who wrote the early live action films, tweeted last year that he tried to make Velma a lesbian, but the studio wanted otherwise. Now, if you Google Velma, you'll see a moment of pride and raining confetti. Welcome back. A surprise settlement tonight in the wrongful death lawsuit against the producers of the movie Rust and Alec Baldwin. The family of cinematographer Helena Hutchins has dropped their case, and now production is moving forward with Hutchins' husband on board. Here's ABC's Zareen Shah. 
Tonight, the widower of cinematographer Helena Hutchins reaching a proposed settlement in his wrongful death lawsuit against Alec Baldwin and the producers of Rust. Matthew Hutchins saying in a statement, I have no interest in engaging in recriminations or attribution of blame to the producers or Mr. Baldwin. All of us believe Helena's death was a terrible accident. The amount of the settlement undisclosed, but the producers announcing filming will resume in January with the original players and now with Helena's husband as a new executive producer. Baldwin's attorney saying everyone has maintained the specific desire to do what is best for Helena's son. We are grateful to everyone who contributed to the resolution of this tragic and painful situation. The district attorney's office in New Mexico today saying the settlement will have no impact on the ultimate decision whether to file criminal charges. Just weeks ago, she asked the state for more funding to cover a possible prosecution of four people, including Baldwin. The fact that this settlement comes shortly after the DA's announcement that charges are seriously being considered is interesting, but... I think that this may have just been the normal process. A recent FBI report found the gun could not be made to fire without a pull of the trigger, apparently contradicting what Alec Baldwin told ABC's George Stephanopoulos. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. After watching that interview, Matthew Hutchins said he was angry that Baldwin didn't take responsibility. The idea that the person holding the gun causing it to discharge is not responsible is absurd to me. Our thanks to Zareen for that. Now to the midterms, less than five weeks away. Michigan has always been a bellwether state. How voters feel there about hot button issues like the economy could go a long way toward determining just which party is in control of Congress come January. So ABC's Mary Alice Parks went to a community near Detroit where the evolving auto industry is a vital part of the economy as the midterms are quickly approaching. On the campaign trail, President Biden touting Democrats' big legislative wins this summer. My economic agenda has ignited historic manufacturing boom here in America. Where is it written that says we can't be the manufacturing hub of the world? Hoping that with gas prices falling and job numbers strong, Democrats can run on positive parts of the economy and new laws designed to help American manufacturers. Folks, since I took office, our economy has created nearly 10 million new jobs, more than 668,000 manufacturing jobs. They're betting big that Americans will overlook recent economic pain for a promise of tomorrow and get excited about a new economy, electric cars and more made in America. Get out of the way, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> this thing flies. We set out to test that theory from Democrats. If voters anywhere in the country would feel the effects of new laws passed in Washington in their everyday life, it would be here, in this manufacturing hub around Motor City. Wayne, Michigan is a small town of only about 17,000 people, but home to a massive Ford plant. Good to meet you. Yep. We met with Mayor John Rasa. So there was an announcement during the pandemic that this is going to become an, the electric highway, mm. Michigan Avenue. Just this summer, Ford announced plans to pump over a billion dollars into this region as it doubles down on electric vehicle manufacturing. Millions of dollars coming right here to the town of Wayne. With more than a quarter of Wayne's residents working for Ford, the news is vital, and the ripple effects for neighborhood businesses could be huge. But for residents here, those coming investments can still feel far away. Nothing's a given, you know, you just don't, you, you just don't know, you know, from day to day, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things. You can tell Wayne is a town that has faced economic hardship, but also that it does not want to be counted out. The mayor tells us there is still anxiety about the shift to electric cars. I see the, the benefits, but I also don't know that the infrastructure is in place to handle that. People here are used to, to gas. I mean, this is just this is what we grew up on. We hop on Michigan Avenue, this main artery connecting manufacturing plants, and drive just a few miles from Wayne's small downtown to the Jack Demmer Ford dealership. How's business? Business is good. It's, it, you know, it, it's different, right? It's, 
you know, the way of doing business pre-COVID is completely a 180 from what we do now. So everything is more of an order to delivery. It's more custom. People are still buying cars. People are still buying cars. One of the major drivers of inflation has been the huge demand for cars. They tell me all of the electric vehicles they have are already sold. Sitting center lot, spotlit in the sun, are two new all-electric Ford vehicles. Yeah. Matt Demmer, who runs the dealership, loves to brag. mach -E is absolutely fantastic. If you've not driven a battery electric vehicle before, it is absolutely insane. The thing, it, it's a rocket ship. He sees me eyeing the new F-150 Lightning and offers a test drive. All right, car's on. Okay. You don't hear it, though. Right, I know, that's wild. All right, let's go down the street here. But he says he does not see his lot filled with only EVs anytime soon. They have to be affordable for everyone because we don't have that today. Outside of Wayne, in a neighboring suburb, we meet up with a group of moms, statistically more likely to be key swing voters in this area. On the issue of electric and hybrid cars, the group is torn. We just got a, a, an electric minivan, a hybrid electric minivan best thing we did earlier this year. My sister bought one a little while ago and she ended up selling it off again because the charging stations they either charge or it's just not as easy as they make it out to be. Front and center in Michigan this year is the state's governor's race, a race between two moms. Tudor Dixon, a businesswoman with a background in Michigan's steel industry, is taking on the sitting Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who's running for a second term. Dixon has campaigned on Whitmer's COVID policies. She says that tough lockdowns hurt businesses and schools. So we're going to keep the schools open. We're going to keep the businesses open. We're going to bring back this economy. Whitmer often talks about maintaining abortion access in the state, but she has not shied away from the economy and has celebrated bills passed in Washington, like the CHIPS Act, designed to make sure more computer chips are made in America. Michigan is on the move. And with this CHIPS and Science Act, we can surge American manufacturing capacity and make up for lost time. The area's auto worker unions agree that the CHIPS Act is a big deal, especially as they try to ramp up making EVs. We build trucks every day and they get parked waiting for parts. Thousands of trucks sit waiting for parts and it's all because of the chip shortage. I sat down with some of the leaders of the local 600 UAW in their union hall. It affects the auto industry, but it affects you know, everything yeah. we do. That's the reason we're glad that the CHIP Act just passed because uh, this country's got to get control of that again. It kind of takes me back to days when I was a young girl watching the Jetsons and you think about the future and this is how it's going to be. I feel secure about my job. Whatever powers a car is an engine, whether it's a battery, whether it's a four cylinder, whether it's a diesel, doesn't make a difference. For this group, if change is coming anyway around the world, the key is not missing out. Vehicles have evolved for a lot of years, I mean, and this is a major evolution, but like I said before, it's coming. Whether it takes 10 years, 20 years, 15 years, five years, we don't know. But we want to make sure we're a major part in, in that process when it happens. The future is just about here. Our thanks to Mary Alice Parks for that. As we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, we're looking at an amazing success story. The Internet has created new paths to major accomplishments for aspiring actors, singers, and also authors. In March of last year, Colombian-American writer Alex Astor posted this video pitching an idea for her book, Light Lark. Every 100 years, a cursed island appears to host a game that gives six rulers of the realm a chance to break their own curses. To do that, one of the six rulers must die, leading the main character to lie and cheat in order to stay alive. But of course, love complicates it all. And Alex Astor joins us now to talk about how that one post changed her life. Welcome to the show, Alex. This is Thank so you. exciting. I mean, tell me how a 15 second TikTok video turned into a publishing mm -hmm. deal and then a New York Times bestseller, no less. It really was a lot of luck mixed with me trying to be published for a very long time before that. And I had two books come out. They were really inspired by my Colombian heritage, but they didn't perform that well because they came out during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and so. This was kind of my plea to the universe of, does anyone want to read this? I had been um, rejected by multiple publishers at that point. It seemed like no one wanted to publish this book. So I made that video and it went viral overnight. When I woke up in the morning, it had over a million views. So many people were commenting like, I want to buy this today. I don't even read books, but this sounds so good. And so it went viral and a week later it went to auction and I got 
the biggest book deal I've ever gotten in my life. And then a year later, I got a movie deal from that video before the book was even out. And, and so I want to pick up mm -hmm. on a few of those points. Yeah. One, you talked about how you got rejected, and yeah. that's really the story of a lot of up-and-coming authors. Mm -hmm. What made you keep pushing? How many rejections did you yeah. get? And how did you know, okay, I'm not going to give up? Yeah, so I actually started trying to be a published author when I was 12. And so by the time I got my first agent, I had been rejected thousands of times for, I think I wrote six different books that will never be published, that were all rejected hundreds of times each. I did end up selling my next book, which was my first book that came out, but again, it didn't do well, and I got dropped by my agent. And then I almost gave up because it had been such a long time, so many rejections, and you always think you're almost there, and then something happens that kind of knocks you down again. Um, so my advice would be just keep going because you only need one yes. And you're only yeah. 27. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I think if I hadn't started so young, it, I, it wouldn't have been like this. I wouldn't have been able to achieve this at 27. Right, you've already been doing this uh, for 15 years it really, at this point. Yeah, I mean, it really feels like so many people have just seen the last one or two years of my life that look so amazing of get, getting the movie deal, getting these book deals, being able to do this full time. I had so many people tell me that my work wasn't good enough, that mm -hmm. I would never be published. And I just, I'm glad that I kept going. Look at you yeah. now, right? <laughs> then you get the last yeah. laugh. I'm sure that many of of those uh, those publishers uh, are, are kicking themselves <laughs> and agents as well. How did you get a yeah. movie deal before mm -hmm. the book was actually even released? So a producer at the production company that produced Twilight, Maze Runner, all the John Green movies saw one of the posts and said, oh, this looks interesting. So they went to my agents and they said, can I read this early? They sent it to them and I didn't hear anything. I didn't really think anything of it, but they loved the book. Everyone at the company loved the book and then they sent it to Universal. Universal loved the book and so they bought the movie rights because they believed in it before it came out and it was a risk for them but they thought we want to take this off the table before there's more competition and and I talked about the plot yeah. a little bit but give us a little bit yeah. more and, and talk about the, the main the central themes in the book I really poured everything I love from those nostalgic like the Hunger Games Twilight mm -hmm. those books that I grew up reading and I love so much I poured all of that in there there's a big sense of mystery there's plot twists and I, I haven't met anyone who has guessed all the plot twists so um um, I hope that it's a mystery until the very last page and you don't know what's going to happen. And you're also going to be in New York Com Comic-Con yes. panelist this coming weekend here in New York. Yes, I'm on a panel with Brandon Sanderson, who's one of the best-selling authors in history. <laughs> and to be next to him on a panel, a fantasy panel, is truly surreal. And, and I never believed that I would get to this point, let alone be surrounded by those people. How many books are going to be in the series? I don't know yet. I'm hoping more than two, which is what I'm contracted for. But I do think think it's going to be beyond the two, but I don't have a final number yet. How long will fans have to wait for the next installment? Oh, it's going to be published less than a year from now, so they won't have to wait very long. Alex, congratulations Thank you. already on all the success. Just uh, so excited Thank for you. you it's, so much. it's really contagious. Thank you. Don't forget about the little people. Oh my all God. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Light Lark is now available wherever books are sold. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, a birthday paint job. This gentleman just gave the famous Hollywood sign a birthday paint job ahead of the sign's 100th anniversary. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Now we're staying on top of a few things. President Biden and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis seemingly putting their differences aside to comfort Hurricane Ian victims as the desperate search continues for survivors. Plus, imagine looking out your window and seeing this, the story behind this rooftop runner. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime anywhere and free this is abc news live america's number one streaming news free to you 24 7. watch america's number one news whenever you want it wherever you are anytime abc news live streaming live and free on all platforms ready for election night i'm ready for debate night i'm ready for it all this midterms is really important. Hi, everyone. We're going to run you ragged. What would George do? You're working on it, George. We're going to make you proud. Yeah.
With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital, and then I just see Shimani as... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Another COVID-19 variant could emerge this winter. That's according to Dr. Fauci. COVID-19 cases have been trending downward in recent months, but winter will push more people inside. Scientists have been tracking three new subvariants in recent weeks. Uvalde parents are still protesting outside the school administration offices after one full week in an attempt to get the officers from that day suspended pending the independent review of the shooting. Traffic gates with a combination padlock were installed at the administrative building only days after protesters arrived. While fencing and security measures at the district schools are not complete more than one month into the school session. Check out this bizarre video of a man running and jumping along rooftops 23 stories up in Manhattan. A neighbor who happens to be an Emmy Award winning film director recorded the wild incident. Our friends at WABC discovered that the mystery man was actually the director of operations who quote, goes out of roofs like this all the time. This feels like the right time to remind our viewers not to try this at home. Today, the president made his first visit to survey Hurricane Ian's devastation in Florida, standing side by side with Florida's Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, who is a frequent critic and a potential rival in 2024. The two offered praise for the response to Ian, Governor DeSantis saying it's been a team effort, President Biden saying they're working completely in lockstep. But as search and rescue efforts are still underway in the hardest hit areas, the president today acknowledged there's a long way to go. Here's ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce. President Biden today traveling to Florida to see for himself the devastation of Hurricane Ian. Putting politics aside, meeting with one of his harshest Republican critics, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, a man many believe hopes to be the next president. Today we have one job and only one job, and that's to make sure the people of Florida get everything that they need to fully, thoroughly recover. In a rare moment of bipartisanship, DeSantis praising their cooperation. We are cutting through the red tape, uh, and that's from local government, state government, all the way up uh, to the president. So we appreciate uh, the, the team effort. Biden describing what DeSantis has done as pretty remarkable. We have very different political philosophies. There's a long way to go here. The National Guard delivering water and aid from Fort Myers to Pine Island, where search and rescue is still underway. The island had been completely cut off. Bernard Tomsey telling me his neighbors were stranded. We're just working people and they can't get off the island. They have no water, they have nothing. But just a few hours later, a temporary crossing opening up. Slowly, the long process to rebuild now beginning. ABC's Victor Okendo out with Team Rubicon, a volunteer group of highly skilled military veterans. We're in Port Charlotte, north of Fort Myers, where residents have been waiting for help for days. Ian brought this massive tree down, blocking this house. The good news, that help has arrived. They're shoring up homes and clearing out debris. Local officials grateful for the help. Cameras capturing the president joking with the mayor of Fort Myers Beach in an unguarded moment. Biden says the federal government will be here in Florida 
for as long as it takes. Nice to see a smile on both of their faces. Got a chance to speak to the mayor of Fort Myers Beach yesterday. Mary Bruce joins us now from Fort Myers. Mary, not quite clear just what the president was joking about there in that unguarded moment, but so many eyes were on the scene of the president and Governor Santos today. I assume it's fair to say both wanted to make it clear that today wasn't about politics. Exactly. And it was a pretty remarkable moment to see the president and one of his biggest Republican rivals very publicly putting their differences on hold. Now agreeing on one thing, that for the sake of the people here in Florida, they have to work together on this. But, Lindsay, with the midterm elections now just 34 days away, it's unclear tonight how long their political ceasefire will last. Lindsay. You're right about that. Mary Bruce from Fort Myers for us. Thanks so much, Mary. Now to late news from North Korea, which has launched a new ballistic missile test. It comes after that missile launch over Japan that sent many running for cover, as well as a mishap during a joint U.S.-South Korea exercise meant to be a show of force. ABC's Martha Raddatz has the latest. Tonight, North Korea launching two short-range ballistic missiles. It comes as the U.S. is sending the aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan back to the region as tensions increase after Monday's launch over Japan left citizens scrambling for cover. South Korea and the U.S. responded with a show of force, but tonight an embarrassing malfunction. A South Korean missile plowed into a military base during a live fire drill with the U.S., turning it into a real live fire. There were no injuries, but South Korea didn't even acknowledge the malfunction until hours after social media videos showed the huge ball of fire. A local lawmaker blasted the military, saying it had threatened and panicked the local population, which was not given warning or an explanation as to what went wrong. Our thanks to Martha for that. Now to the war in Ukraine, where there are some disturbing developments tonight as Ukrainian forces advance and Russian forces abandon more cities and towns. They are leaving behind evidence of torture and abuse. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel reports on what he has witnessed firsthand. Tonight, Ukrainian forces trying to build on their stunning advances on the battlefield, now pressuring Russian troops in the east and south of the country. Despite his losses, Vladimir Putin signing into law the illegal annexation of the very territory where Ukraine's now advancing. Also tonight, the New York Times is reporting American officials believe Ukraine was behind the car bombing that killed the daughter of prominent Russian nationalist Alexander Dugin in August. The Times report says U.S. officials say they weren't aware of the operation beforehand, provided no intelligence or other assistance in the car bombing, and would have opposed the killing had they been consulted. As Russian troops retreat, a dark picture of torture and abuse is now emerging. We've come deep underground below a police station in the city of Izium that was occupied by the Russians for months. And like so many areas, when the Russians were driven out, the horror stories started to emerge of detention, of abuse and of torture. It's dark down here, it's damp, and you can almost smell the fear of the people who were held here. Mikhailo says he was taken by Russian soldiers, tortured for 13 days and left for dead. The 67-year-old accused of passing information to the Ukrainians. He says he was electrocuted, had metal spikes pushed into his shoulders and his arm was broken with a hammer, all by Russian interrogators. Can you ever forgive? Can you ever forget what happened? His answer needs no translation. And according to the UN... There are now hundreds of Ukrainians with stories just like this. Lindsay, this feels like a critical moment in this war. The Ukrainians now have real momentum. And I think it's an open question whether or not Russia can halt their advance. And if they can't, what does Vladimir Putin do next, especially with public criticism of him rising at home? Lindsay? Ian, thank you. OPEC Plus, the organization of petroleum exporting countries, which includes Russia, has announced that it will cut back production by 2 million barrels a day, a decision that could be devastating for gas prices here at home. Joining us now for more context and analysis is business reporter Alexis Christophorus. Alexis, uh, thank you, as always, for, for joining My us pleasure. to help explain this. So let's just start off with the basics here. Um, why post-COVID, when you have all of the, the turmoil that's happening overseas, why would they do this now? 
It's a great question. And OPEC's job, in short, is to stabilize oil prices on the global market. For a few years now, because of the pandemic, these 33 countries that make up OPEC Plus have been enduring relatively low oil prices. So what they're trying to do with this production cut is lift the price of oil on the world market. They, they say their sweet spot is at around $90 a barrel for crude oil. They say that will help to stabilize world economies, and they think it will also incentivize investment in the industry. But what it's going to probably wind up doing is sending gas prices prices higher around the world. And so what about here at home in particular? Well, you know, a lot of that depends on regional factors. I don't think we're going to go back to that $5 a gallon nationwide average we saw in June. But in California, for instance, we've got folks paying in some places as much as $8 a gallon. Those prices prices should start to come down over the next few weeks because of refinery issues being taken care of there. But overall, you're probably looking at 15 to 30 cents more a gallon in most parts of the country in the coming weeks. Is there anything that the Biden administration can do about this to make sure, again, as you said, we don't get back to those $5 right. uh, on average uh, across the country? There's very little the Biden administration can do. And, and they've said as much. The, the Biden administration has tapped that strategic petroleum reserve. They're probably going to do it again. But those reserves are already at their lowest level since 1984. You can only go back to the well literally so many times before that becomes an issue. You're only supposed to tap that in an emergency situation, not to manipulate prices. The Biden administration could also put a, uh, a limit on how much we export to other countries. But again, that could backfire on this country because it means it's putting less oil on the market, which will just add to the energy crunch, which will make prices go up even higher. And I started off by talking about the war in Ukraine. How much of a factor is that, along with the relationship between Russia and, and Saudi Arabia? How does that play a role here? This gets complicated, and there are so many tentacles. Just three months ago, President Biden met with the Saudi prince, Mohammed al Salman to try and see if he could turn on the spigot and put more oil on the market to uh, give us some relief at the gas pump. He walked away basically empty-handed. Uh, the prince, has, for a long time, has said he admires Vladimir Putin. The two men have had a much deeper relationship recently. So really, this, this alliance between these two countries and also the OPEC decision is really seen as a slap of the face to the Biden administration right now. And how do you think that this OPEC decision might play out in, in the midterm elections? Oh, boy. Well, you know, President Biden has been talking for months now about what he and his administration are doing to help get prices down at the pump. This comes at a critical time for uh, the president. This is really political jeopardy for him as we move closer to the midterms. And in some very pivotal states where there are some key, hotly contested races in the balance, gas prices are the highest there right now. And is this effective immediately? When are they going to actually start the reduction? And when might we see these increases at the pump? Great question. They're going to start it in November. We could start to see price increases at the pump as early as the next couple of weeks because the oil market is anticipatory. So those price rises are already going to start to happen. And by the way, this OPEC production cut is going to be in place through 2023 oh, wow. unless world conditions change. And so this is going to start right around the holiday time. Not exactly. such a great time. That's, okay, That's a good point, yes. Uh, Alexis Christophorus, our thanks to you as always. You bet. Now to chilling new surveillance video of the family kidnapped in California. Police have made an arrest, but the eight-month-old baby girl, her parents and uncle are still missing. ABC's Mo Lange has the details. Tonight, the emotional pleas for the safe return of an eight-month-old and her family in California. Please help us out, come forward, so my family come home safe. Baby Aruhi Derry, her 27-year-old mother, Jasleen Kaur, her 36-year-old father, Jasdeep Singh, and 39-year-old uncle, Amandeep Singh, were allegedly kidnapped Monday. Overnight, authorities arresting 48-year-old Jesus Manuel Salgado. Time is of the essence. That person right now is our, our sole lead. Authorities releasing surveillance video they say shows the kidnapping outside the family's trucking business in Merced. The suspect meeting Jasdeep outside, carrying a trash bag. He then puts down the bag, appears to show a gun before entering the building where police say there are no cameras. Minutes later, they emerge. It also appears that Jasdeep and Amandeep are zip tied behind the bags. Jasdeep and Amandeep are then put in the back of a black pickup truck and driven off. The suspect later returns, retrieving Jasleen and baby Aruhi unrestrained before driving away. Authorities say it's the last time the family is seen on camera. Hours later, the pickup truck found on fire. A vehicle fire in an orchard. There are no signs of the family. Then, early Tuesday morning, investigators say the suspect allegedly uses a victim's ATM card. Authorities identifying Salgado as a person of interest. 
the sheriff telling ABC News that his family turned him in. The suspect said he had done something wrong and it had something to do with the missing people. Authorities say Salgado attempting suicide, taken into custody in critical condition. He's receiving treatment. Tonight, authorities are holding out hope that he will cooperate and that the family will be found. We're not leaving any, any stone unturned, any blade of grass. Everything we have is out there. Mola Lange joins us now from California. Uh, Mola, do we know anything else about the investigation and also the suspect? Well, Lindsay, police say that it is possible Salgado did not act alone. Of course, they are hoping that they can speak to him. Now, he does have a criminal record, a prior conviction back in 2005 for armed robbery and false imprisonment. Lindsay, he was paroled back in 2015. All right, Mola Lange, thanks so much. Authorities are investigating the murder of a college student at Purdue University. Police say he was killed overnight by his roommate. Inside a residence hall on campus, students were woken up by screams and loud noises. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, a suspect is under arrest in the murder of a Purdue University student. Authorities say 20-year-old Varun Manish Chetta, a senior, was found with stab wounds in his dorm room early Wednesday morning. One roommate has attacked another with a knife, still trying to attain room number. According to authorities, Chetta's roommate, 22-year-old Ji Min Shah, placing a call to police reporting the incident. The junior and international student from South Korea then arrested on a preliminary murder charge. Neither, neither one of them were asleep and... I believe this was unprovoked and senseless. Purdue University assuring students the campus is safe, releasing a statement saying that an investigation is underway, adding, this is as tragic an event as we can imagine happening on our campus, and our hearts and thoughts go out to all of those affected by this terrible event. A preliminary autopsy report shows Chetta suffered multiple sharp forced traumatic injuries. A vigil is being held on the campus tonight. Lindsay. Stephanie, thank you. A surprise settlement tonight in the wrongful death lawsuit against the producers of the movie Rust and Alec Baldwin. The family of cinematographer Helena Hutchins dropped their case and now production is moving forward with Hutchins' husband on board. Here's ABC's Zareen Shah. Tonight, the widower of cinematographer Helena Hutchins reaching a proposed settlement in his wrongful death lawsuit against Alec Baldwin and the producers of Rust. Matthew Hutchins saying in a statement, I have no interest in engaging in recriminations or attribution of blame to the producers or Mr. Baldwin. All of us believe Helena's death was a terrible accident. The amount of the settlement undisclosed, but the producers announcing filming will resume in January with the original players and now with Helena's husband as a new executive producer. Baldwin's attorney saying, Everyone has maintained the specific desire to do what is best for Helena's son. We are grateful to everyone who contributed to the resolution of this tragic and painful situation. The district attorney's office in New Mexico today saying the settlement will have no impact on the ultimate decision whether to file criminal charges. Just weeks ago, she asked the state for more funding to cover a possible prosecution of four people, including Baldwin. The fact that this settlement comes shortly after the DA's announcement that charges are seriously being considered is interesting, but I think that this may have just been the normal process. A recent FBI report found the gun could not be made to fire without a pull of the trigger, apparently contradicting what Alec Baldwin told ABC's George Stephanopoulos. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. After watching that interview, Matthew Hutchins said he was angry that Baldwin didn't take responsibility. The idea that the person holding the gun, causing it to discharge, is not responsible is absurd to me. Seems he's had quite a change of heart. And Zareen Shah joins us now. Zareen, where does the criminal case in Hutchins' death stand at this point? Lindsay, the DA says if the facts and evidence warrant charges under New Mexico law, then charges will be brought. No one is above the law. Lindsay? Zareen Shah for us. Thanks so much, Zareen. And still to come, booking your holiday travel could be a huge burden on your budget. How to get the best prices before they skyrocket. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Welcome back. We're traveling, tracking several headlines around the world. Israeli forces killed a Palestinian man during clashes in the occupied West Bank, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. At least six other Palestinians, including two journalists, were wounded by Israeli fire. The clashes began when Israeli forces surrounded the house of a man suspected of being a member of Hamas, the Islamist militant group. The Israeli military did not immediately respond for a request to comment. Thousands of Hungarian students, teachers, and parents blocked a Budapest bridge near Parliament in support of teachers fighting for higher wages and teachers fired for protesting. Some held up banners, no teachers, no future, and who will teach tomorrow? While cars passing in the morning traffic blew horns in support, the government said it would hike teachers' wages once the European Commission releases EU recovery funding to Hungary, which has been withheld over disputes. Take a look at this wild dive. Australia's six-time Red Bull Cliff Diving World Series champion celebrated her latest series victory by diving off of a helicopter into Sydney Harbor. The 31-year-old dove 65 feet into the water with the Sydney Opera House and Sydney Harbor Bridge in the background, ticking off a long-standing bucket list wish. Well, of course, it is not yet Halloween, but that does not mean you shouldn't start looking ahead to booking your winter holiday travel. Prices are already high, and experts forecast that they're only going to get higher. To help us plan ahead, Clint Henderson, the managing editor of The Points Guy, is back with us. Clint, thanks so much for joining us again. So let's start off with the do's and don'ts of holiday travel. So do book now okay? because we're expecting prices to go even higher. You know, we got really lucky during the fall because prices had come down off their peaks from the summer. But now we're seeing the holidays are exorbitant, highest we've seen in like five years. So do book now, especially if you see a, a deal. Uh, don't wait until the last minute. We don't think prices are going to come down before the holidays. And, and you were kind of sharing a personal story about potentially booking a round trip ticket to San Francisco. Tell me how much of an increase you saw. Yeah, so normally I can get the, the flight from New York to San Francisco for about three to 400. Right now it's anywhere from 600 to 1200. Even if I fly on the holiday itself, which usually is my trick to tell people, oh, travel on Christmas Eve you can save a bunch of money. Right now, that trick is not working. So you've really got to be strategic right now. So for the procrastinators, when would you say is the last minute that they really could think about booking for the holidays? So what's interesting is sometimes at the very last minute, if, if you can survive without doing the trip, you will see prices drop like right before. But I think this year, you want to book by October 10th, I would say, ideally, especially if you see a deal. Now, if prices are really high like they are for me, 
I'm going to set a Google alert and I'm mm. just going to monitor it for the next two weeks because prices are so high, they're probably not going to increase any more than they already are. But if you see a deal right now, you got to jump on it, especially for Thanksgiving, Christmas holiday, peak travel. And, and let's say that you did actually go ahead and book that flight and maybe it's 500. Should you stop looking at that point once you've actually committed? No, these days, because the airlines have made it easier to get flight credits if you uh, cancel the trip. Uh, so that's one good thing from the pandemic. They've really made it easier to get a travel credit. So what you can do is monitor the price. If you see the price drop substantially, cancel that ticket, get the flight credit, and then rebook the ticket for the cheaper price. And you can pocket the difference. Um, it'll be a credit, it won't be cash, but hey, we'll take it, right? And let me just circle back on, on something that you just said. Is it possible for somebody to say, I'm just gonna go down to the wire and bet that the prices are gonna drop? Do you think that that's a winning strategy? It can be, it's risky because you, you never know, prices could stay the same and then you end up canceling the trip or paying the peak price. So that's a risky gambit. I would rather tell people to take those points and miles you've been hoarding during the pandemic and use those when cash prices are really high because you're gonna get the absolute maximum value right now if cash prices are high for that ticket. And that raises a good point because with dollars and miles, when the dollars go up, are the miles going equally as high? So it's interesting. The airlines are getting better and better at pricing them similarly. So you will see a lot of times if cash prices are high, points prices are high, but that's not always the case. You can still find really good values at times. Okay, and then lastly, why are the prices higher than they than they normally would be this time? So you've got a combination of things. A lot of people that stayed home during the last two or three years because of the pandemic, they're, they're saying, let's just go on that trip. I don't care what it costs, I'm gonna go. So demand has increased. People are finally willing to travel, pent up demand. That's meeting fewer seats available. So the airlines have cut back capacity and the number of flights they're flying each day, like on that New York to San Francisco route, there's less flights available. So you have more people competing for less seats mm -hmm. and that drives prices higher. Hey, fuel prices don't help on that matter That's either. Right. All right, Clint Henderson, always so helpful to have you yeah. with us. Thank you. Good to see you. And still to come, a rugby player spent more than 100 days at sea, but it wasn't for a pleasure cruise. Why her name is now in the record books. an extraordinary news-making year. And now with the historic midterms inching closer, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Ready for election night, I'm ready for debate night, I'm ready for it all. This midterms is really important. Hi everyone. We're gonna run you ragged. What would George do? You're working on it, George, we're gonna make you proud. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA-ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. One man just row, row, rowed his way right into the record books. A former professional rugby player spent 112 days at sea to become the first person to ever row a boat from New York all the way to Ireland. That's more than 3,400 nautical miles. Reporter N.J. Burkett from our partner station WABC has this story at sea in tonight's Local Lowdown. The tiny boat made landfall on the rocky, windswept shores of Ireland, where Damien Brown received a hero's welcome. I learned that I, I crave um, connection with people around me um, and that that's something that I really need to pour more time into 
connecting on deeper levels with those people. Um, it gives you great perspective on what's important in your life. I'm feeling so relieved and so joyful and uh, just so proud of him, of his achievement and can't believe it that he's here. Damien and his friend Fergus Farrell, both Irish citizens, left New York City in June. Determined to set a world record for transatlantic rowing in a custom made 20 foot fiberglass boat. I think I'm the most normal person I know. We're going for the world record, which is 55 days, 13 hours. But in just two weeks, Farrell would become ill and would be forced to abandon the trip, leaving Brown to cross the ocean alone, braving mountainous seas and howling winds while struggling with equipment failures. We're going to be here for about two days, two and a half days. Um, we're about 37 nautical miles from land to the east, so fingers crossed. With just one man to stroke the oars, the trip would take twice as long, nearly four months at sea. Fergus Farrell was there to greet his bearded friend. Now I just feel, uh, I I'm absolutely feel relief because Demo's got home because I've left him alone out in that ocean, so I'm relieved that he's here. What a feat there are. Thanks to N.J. Burkett for bringing us that. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Because... Uh America's number one news, ABC.